Uh, good morning. Uh, so we got to the end of uh, Karl Marx today. Um, and after um, a long uh, detour, we are finally at the Marx uh, you are probably the most familiar with, or the kind of Marx you have heard the most about. Uh, the major, my major aim uh, so far in this course was to um, shake a little the stereotypes uh, which was in your head about Marx, to show you that Marx was a much more complex thinker, uh, full with contradictions, um, uh, and uh, in uh, a search for truths. Uh, whether he arrived at truth, that's another question, but he was desperately searching for it. So we went uh, around different uh, uh, epochs of Marx, right? Um, in uh, the Paris manuscripts, the first attempt to write a big work, uh, right, we saw him as a Hegelian. The central concept is still alienation, a Hegelian concept. Then he breaks away, right? He turns into a historical materialist in the German ideology, but um, does not quite get it yet, right? Too much under the influence of Adam Smith. The division of labor is too important, and a private property does not get the centrality of the analysis what it's supposed to have for the theory. Uh, then. Uh, you read the Grundrisse, in which he kind of, uh, now private property is in the central place, but he tries to bring back um, um, uh, the idea of uh, uh, alienation. And he also uh, uh, considers that in the German ideology he became too deterministic. History is more open than uh, he may have believed. Um, and then, finally, uh, he finishes the book, <laughs> at least the first, first volume of the book. He always wanted to write, Das Kapital. And in the Capital, only the first volume was right, uh, was finished by him, and it was the only first volume what he thought is, was ready for publication and came out in 1867. Um, he offers a very coherent, very cogent argument. It's not a messy text uh, like the Paris Manuscript or the German Ideology or the Grundrisse. Marx felt this is ready to be printed. And it was ready to be printed for sure. And this is now his major contribution, um, uh, the, th uh, the theory of exploitation. Uh, uh, that is uh, undoubtedly Marx's major contribution to social theory. Whether it is right or wrong, this is another question. Um, I think uh, there are a few people who would accept his theory of exploitation the way how it was formulated. But there are still quite a few theorists around here who are attracted to the idea of exploitation and try to reconceptualize the notion of uh, exploitation in one way or another. And it's also something which has very much entered the public discourse. You yourself use it. Occasionally you feel, I have been exploited. And it actually has quite a bit to do with what Marx thought about exploitation. When you say, this is an exploitative relationship, right? So the term uh, is with us. Um, Okay, and then, uh, of course, uh, in order to have the theory of exploitation, this is necessary for Marx to have a tight conception of the theory of classes. And the text I ask you to read uh, for his uh, theory of classes uh, is an old text, much precedes the theory of exploitation, uh, the Communist Manifesto. It's also only a pamphlet. It is a political pamphlet. It's not aimed uh, for a, a scholarly audience. It does not argue its case in the scholarly way. 
as most of the argument is put forward in the chapter I asked you to read from Capital, right? But it's, it has a, a very important theoretical insights. Um, uh, in, in fact, though Marx does not have the theory of exploitation, he still comes very close to a mature class theory. What is interesting though, we, today we identify Marx as certainly one of the great uh, theorists who created the idea of class. The other one is, by the way, Max Weber. What is also interesting about both of them, that they never wrote any coherent analysis of what class is. Well, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels write a fair deal about class, but they don't have the um, conceptual apparatus yet, really, to do it right. And by the time he has, after he finished the first volume of Capital, he actually makes an attempt, uh, what eventually was published by Engels as the third volume of Capital. And here in chapter 52, he said, now this is time to write my theory of class. He writes a page and a half, and then he abandons it. He said, I can't do it. Too difficult, right? So it leaves to you, right? And the next text, a test in this course to figure out what the right theory of classes are and what's wrong about it, right? And in fact, Weber is pretty much in the same bind. He writes a little more than one and a half page, but not much more. We will talk about this when we can come uh, to Max Weber. But classes certainly still do hunt us, right? We cannot get the idea of class out of our, our, our hair. Even in the United States, uh, the notion is around us. Though there is no other modern society which is so free from the idea of class and exploitation as the US of A. But even in the US of A, we still talk at least about the middle class. So the term is not completely alien from us. Okay, so let's jump into this and let's do it this time in a reverse order that I start uh, with the mature theory, 1867, and then informed by this theory, I go back to 1848, uh, the Communist Manifesto, um, and deal with this. So uh, the major themes uh, uh, for the lecture today is I want to um, elaborate on the um, theory of exploitation in Marx. Um, uh, his uh, uh, idea of classes in history, and finally to ask the question, how many classes are there? Uh, Marx seems to have contradictory answers to this question. And this is certainly a question which still fascinates um, people who are studying uh, society, social stratification, or class structure. Of course, the answer is, seems to be obvious probably to most of you. Yeah, in the United States there is one class, the middle class. We are all middle class, right? That's a typical American answer to this. But for an analyst, it's a bit dubious answer. If there are classes, how on earth there is only one? Anyway, we will talk about this a great deal. So let's move to the question of theory of exploitation. And I will have to start this uh, with the labor theory of value and to go back to Adam Smith and to see how Marx is proceeding. Uh, then um, I want to make a, a step further, uh, Marx's distinction uh, uh, between commodity production and the capitalist mode of production. This is again uh, taking his point of departure as Adam Smith. Adam Smith's idea of commercial society and what Marx does well 
there are different types of commercial societies. One he calls um, the petty commodity production and the other one capitalist mode of production. As we all know, he never used the term capitalism. He comes the closest to this concept by using the term capitalist mode of production. Neither Smith nor Marx had the concept of capitalism as such. Uh, uh, then, uh, in order to understand what is unique about the capitalist mode of production, uh, we have to understand Marx's theory of labor power as a commodity. And I will explain to you why this is so central to Marx's theory of exploitation and then Marx's theory of class. OK, so that's about it. And now the labor theory of value. Uh, the point of departure is uh, uh, John Locke and Adam Smith. right? As you recall, uh, already John Locke uh, suggested uh, that all value is created by labor. Or, I mean, he's a little more cautious. Uh, at least 90% of all value is created by labor. Uh, how on earth he comes up with this figure is not very accurate about this, not very forthcoming, right? A social scientist today would be a bit upset. Where do you get this number from, right? Uh, he doesn't tell us. But the bottom line is well taken, right? You remember clearly, uh, right? Uh, his wonderful uh, proposition. Um, uh, the water in the well belongs to everybody, but who doubts that those who fetch it are uh, the water? That water belongs to him or her because it is his or her uh, product, labor product. And what is the value of that water uh, that you are carrying away? Uh, from the well, what you did fetch from the well? At exactly the amount of labor you had to put in in order to fetch that. Clear, right? A nice theory of property, right? And a nice labor theory of value, though it's not quite called this way by John Locke, but so is by Adam Smith. And as you recall, right, Adam Smith claims at one point all value is created by labor. Um, uh, well, but of course, uh, uh, Adam Smith, uh, when he comes to explaining the distribution of wealth, uh, takes a step back from this proposition. And we discussed that when we discussed Adam Smith. Let me just remind you what the step back for it. Right? The tension right, in um, Adam Smith was that on one hand he claims all value is created by labor, and then it, when it comes to the question, but how is wealth or income distributed? He said, well, it ought to be in, uh, distributed between the three factors of production, right? Labor, capital, and land. Wages, profit, and rent. And they have to be equally distributed in a just way between these three factors of production, right? And I think you remember we clarified that this is not a contradiction in Adam Smith. He somehow, when he is claiming that all value is created by labor, he almost has a theory of human nature, right? That in the state of nature, when there is no private property of land, and where there is no accumulation of capital, then all value is created by labor. But this is just in this imagined, right? Um, uh, um, natural conditions of existence. In all complex societies, uh, private ownership exists. 
and private uh, 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 and capital is being accumulated. And then, you know, in order to get production going, uh, the capitalist has to rent, uh, give uh, capital, advance capital to the worker. Without the advancement of capital, the laborer could not work. And therefore, the owner of capital has due claim for part of the value which is created in the process of production. Because it took risks, right? by uh, offering its uh, capital, and it had to supervise the labor process and wants to have compensated for its risk-taking and uh, its supervision. And you could not operate without land, without a site. All activities need a site, and if somebody owns that site, they'll have to be compensated that you are on the site, and that is rent. Well, this is a little more problematic in Adam Smith. You know, for capital, he makes a pretty strong case, you know, why it is fair for the capitalists to collect profit. For the owner of the land, he, they are collecting rent. That's a little more problematic, whether rent is also something, a just income. And we all have a little unease, right? when we are talking about rent, or when we are talking about, for instance, rent-seeking behavior, right? That sounds a bad behavior if somebody is seeking rent, right? The reason is simple, because we associate in our mind rent-seeking behavior with monopoly, right? Rent-seeking behavior comes from monopolistic ownership, and we don't particularly like monopolies, right? We want competition, free competition, right? Free markets and not monopolies, right? Monopoly is a bad word. Anyway, this is a little of a problem, but nevertheless, I think his fundamental point in Adam Smith that there is some fair distribution uh, of uh, uh, income between the three factors of production because they are all necessary uh, for, um, the, uh, for uh, uh, the production of, uh, for production process. Uh, I, I just suggested that, in fact, there are still uh, uh, people, who, scholars, who are seriously interested um, in, uh, uh, in, in, in theory of exploitation today. They usually abandon the labor theory of value. I have not met yet an economist or political economist or even a sociologist or political scientist who still believes in the labor theory of value, right? So now, therefore, when they try to construct a theory of exploitation, it is more around the theory of rent rather than labor theory of value. Okay, then let's move further and let's try to figure out how, what Marx does to Adam Smith and how he radicalizes Adam Smith. Uh, Marx does not want to go uh, the Adam Smithian way, uh, to say there is a fair distribution of wealth between the three factors of production. First of all, he asks the question, okay, what is value? And he defines value with this very simple equation. Uh, uh, C is constant capital, right? Constant capital means the capital which is advanced by the capitalist in order to make the labor process possible. Uh, constant capital can, of course, involve the, the improvement on the land on the site of uh, what you are uh, using for your production process, right? If there is a building put up on a site, the cost of the building will have to be returned in the process of production, right? And therefore, it will also contribute to the value of the product. V is variable capital. Variable capital means wages. And S, 
is what he calls surplus uh, product. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you, you produce a product, you sell it, uh, it is not enough uh, for you in order to be and stay in business if all what you collect, a return of the capital you advanced for the production and the wages what you paid to your laborers uh, to complete the process. If you would do that, you would be done, right? All smart entrepreneurs want to generate some surplus. They want to get a little more than they started with. Otherwise, why on earth would they waste their time on this, right? Why on earth would they take risks? Why would they spend their time supervising the process? Why would they start worrying whether this will work out or not? They need a surplus. So therefore, that is the value of the product. Now, uh, and here is, right? Constant capital is investment. And here there is an agreement, right, with Adam Smith, right? You have, right, uh, factors of production. But Marx wants to be consistent. Consistent in saying that all value is be being created by labor. And he said, but what is constant capital? Where does constant capital come from? He said it is coming from labor. It is accumulated labor. It is labor which was actually performed before capital accumulation, was appropriated by the capitalist, and it is being now used as constant capital. So there is, one argument is, all capital was at one point a product of labor. Um, and that is what is your investment. So as I said, variable capital are wages, and then there is surplus product. Uh, and that surplus product, will Mar Marx argue, is also uh, the outcome of the labor process and the product of the laborer as such. So Marx tries to shy away from the idea that there is a kind of fair distribution uh, between uh, capital, uh, land, uh, and labor. He said, no, I mean all value is being created uh, by uh, labor. So this is his kind of reconstruction of the labor theory of value and leads us into the idea of exploitation, right? We will, I will labor on this in a minute to try to put more meat on it. But the essence of exploitation is that the, what the capitalist uh, uh, will advance uh, is actually labor which was appropriated from the workers in an earlier cycle of the production. And then the capitalist will pocket the surplus, will not give any to the worker. A worker will be satisfied with the wages. And this is where exploitation comes from, right? Uh, exploitation somehow has to do uh, with what the capitalist had to put into the production process, right? Constant capital and variable capital, and how much he pocketed after the process was all over. Uh, so there is no, nothing fair about this in Marx's view. This is right the big difference between social democratic trade unions who wants to keep the capitalist system going. They just want to have collective bargaining and negotiation, right, with the employers, so to have a reasonable level of profit. Uh, to the capitalists, and a reasonably high level of wages for the workers. Marx said, well, there is nothing reasonable. This is a system, an exploitative system. Um, well, and this is what I said, the rate of profit will be the surplus divided by uh, the expenditures. Okay, let's move a little further and make, and let's have a it is important contribution that Marx makes between petty commodity production and capitalist mode of production, right? Trying sort of break up 
um, uh, uh, Adam Smith's idea of commercial society or market economy or capitalism, uh, Marx seemed to have a more complex notion. Now he said this is petty commodity production, and he again offers us a little equation here. He said um, petty commodity production uh, begins uh, with a commodity, uh, and then uh, you go to the marketplace, sell this commodity for money, uh, in order to purchase a commodity. Uh, this itself is commercial society. This is commodity production. But it is not capitalism. Right? Uh, this is why Marx, for instance, was a bit uncertain. Uh, he's rambling about this a little. Is the United States in the early 19th century really a capitalist economy? And he, he was puzzled by this because the overwhelming majority of Americans were actually involved in self-employment. It was a highly commercialized society, a highly developed market economy, but there was relatively little private capital accumulation. Most people were farmers or self-employed artisans or merchants. And what did they do? They did produce commodities. You were a shoemaker, you produced a shoe, but you were specializing in shoe, shoe making, and you did not bother, you tried to also raise chickens and to have eggs. So you needed eggs, so you brought shoes on the market, you sold the shoe for money, and then you went to the farmer, and you bought egg, so you could have your scrambled eggs, right? Okay, that is petty commodity production, right? Um, and the purpose of production, this is a, a very important proposition by Marx, is satisfaction of needs, right? You are operating, you are producing stuff because you have certain needs what you want to satisfy, and the production of some good well in excess of what you need has the purpose to satisfy other needs what you have, and money is simply a mediator to make sure that different types of needs are being properly exchanged on the marketplace. Right? Now Marx here is way beyond Marx of the Paris manuscripts, right? Uh, who try to identify markets and commodity exchange as the source of alienation. There is nothing uh, alienating about this process, right? Now, but then he said, well, capitalism is a different ballgame. We are talking about a capitalist economy when the cycle starts with money. Uh, and though, I mean, the chapters uh, you have read, Marx tries to discipline himself. He tries to really behave and to be a scholar, right? But he can't resist, right? His emotions, right, and his values are too strong. So he said, you're money bag, talking about the capitalists. He should not have said so, right? He could have done this coolly, objectively, simply to say, well, we have an, an economic system in which we have, right, people who accumulated capital and they are entering the marketplace. And what do they do? They produce commodities. Um, and why do they do so? Because they want to have more money. That's it. And I would say this is bingo, right? I mean, the comparison between the two is really capturing in a very powerful way, right? The emergence of what we understand a capitalist economy, right? As distinct simply from a commercial society. I think this is a very, very important and very insightful, very simple, very precise, and very persuasive argument. Um, now let me just uh, uh, 
uh, say a few more words about this. Why is this so? Uh, uh, why does the capitalist need more money than it started uh, the process? And I will get into uh, a bit uh, later in, in more uh, details. Uh, well, there are very good reasons for it. One reason we already mentioned. Why should the capitalist bother, right, advancing capital and taking risks unless it is compensated by more money? And that's in itself a good enough reason. But there is an even more important reason. We are on a competitive marketplace. In a competitive marketplace, in a capitalist economy, which in Marx's own word is the most dynamic economy in human history, there is improvement in technologies. The capitalist will create uh, more money because it will have to reinvest this money in the production process. It has to improve its technology. If it would stop to do so, the competition would wipe it out. So the capitalist has to collect right more money than it started the production process. Even the most altruistic capitalist has to collect more money at the end of the process. Even the capitalist who said, I'm such a good man, all what I'm doing is to creating jobs for those poor, poor people that they can have a decent living and a nice suburban home, and I don't want anything in exchange for it. I do it out of altruism. Okay, let's imagine an altruistic money bag, right? Still, the poor guy does not have a chance. It has to collect more money because otherwise, next year, he will not be around any longer. He cannot be altruistic any longer because the competition will wipe him out, right? That's the argument. Okay. So now, here comes Marx, he said, this is a big change because now the purpose of production is not satisfaction of needs, uh, but it is really a generation of profit, which is inevitable because competition among capitalists. Now comes the big puzzle. Where on earth the more money comes from? How, how is it possible? that the capitalist goes out uh, with money, buys commodities, and gets more money at the end. Is the capitalist cheating us? Buys cheap and sell dear? Uh, he said, well, this is impossible. If there would be a capitalist who would buy cheap and sell dear, and would pocket a profit this way, there will be other who will say, well, I will compete and I will sell it uh, less expensively, and I will sell more, and I will create more profit, and we'll push right, these artificially high prices down. There is supply and demand which sets the prices. So the, the more money cannot come out of cheating, right? Uh, it simply cannot come out simply for circulation. It somehow has to come out from the production. Now, how can it happen that more money is created? And this is where the idea of labor power uh, as a commodity comes in. What the capitalist does, it buys on the marketplace a specific commodity. And this specific commodity is labor market. And labor market, so Mark argues, is that commodity the only commodity which actually can produce a higher value when it is consumed than its own value. In every other input, right, be it a raw material, the amount of labor which was put into that raw material, when in a production process you consume it, that is being transferred into the value of the new product. Uh, so uh, you are producing a refrigerator, you need steel or aluminum to produce it. The value which was put into the production of steel or aluminum will be carried over exactly the same amount into uh, the refrigerator you produce. So it cannot create more value, right? What can create 
The only commodity which produces more is labor power as such. Well, and this is also important that Marx suggests, therefore, what the labor has to sell it cannot be labor. It must be labor power. Well, it's, you may be Talmudistic stuff, right? It's twisting words, but it isn't. I think there's an important idea, he said. He said, if you would sell labor, then, and if, if, we, if, we, if uh, John Locke was right, right? And all value is created by the laborer and belongs to the laborer. Then the capitalist would have to cheat you, right? Would not be able to sell, give you the price of your labor. Could not have a surplus value or a profit otherwise. Therefore, the capitalist will have to buy labor power, the capacity of work. Um, and Marx insists we have to think about a system in which the capitalist price pays the proper price, the exact price, the market price, the right market price for labor power. Uh, the worker is not cheated. The worker is exploited, but that's not cheating, right? So why? What is so unique about the labor power, right? And let me just emphasize, it's very, very important for the chapters what you have read, that it, those are always equivalents which have to exchange each other at the, per, at, the, uh, at the marketplace. No cheating. The, the worker is not being cheated. It gets the proper price for this labor power. So, but what is the price of the labor power? It's exactly like the price of any other commodity. The price of its reproduction, right? How much labor is necessary to reproduce that uh, 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 a commodity. If labor power is a commodity, the price of the labor power is exactly how much is necessary to reproduce that labor power. It involves, right, your, the cost of your housing, the cost of your living, and the extended reproduction of labor power. It involves that you have to raise children, it involves education, Cap, you know, human capital investment, this all will have to be compensated for the laborer. But if it is compensated, then the laborer is compensated for its laboring capacities, labor power, will work under the supervision of the capitalist, and the capitalist will make sure that the laborer, after the uh, cost of the reproduction of labor power are covered, will work another three or four or five hours under the supervision of the capitalist and start producing surplus value for the capitalist or profit for the capitalist, right? That is, right, a stroke of the genius, right? That's the big solution what he is offering. And this is, uh, yeah, this is why I said, though, yeah, that is a heavy, of, of course he hates capitalism, of course he hates exploitation. But uh, if you look at the logic of the analysis, this is pretty cool-headed analysis and does not imply value judgments, right? Does not imply moral judgment. You can go through all this and to say, yes, why, sure, that's, that's it, that's how the system works. He does hate it, and as I said, he cannot uh, uh, stop and uh, expresses it. Okay, let me talk about classes very briefly. Uh, and now we are back to uh, the Communist uh, Manifesto. And uh, there are really uh, a couple of uh, uh, issues here. He's talking about classes uh, as a transhistorical category, which in a way is contradictory to the argument of Das Kapital. He's talking about the bourgeoisie as a new class and, and as a progressive class. Now let's uh, look at this, classes as a transhistorical category. Like this is written almost 20 years before Das Kapital, we saw the theory of exploitation. And he said the history of all previously existing societies is the history of class struggle. And you remember I said this idea is becoming already in the German ideology where he tries to develop these um, uh, 
causal mechanism, right, which explains evolution in history, and this is class struggle all along, right? The struggle of the serfs against uh, the slaves against the slave owners, the serfs against the landlord, and finally it will be the struggle of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie. That's the idea, right? And this is being uh, used in a transhistorical way. The trouble is that this is obviously wrong. It's wrong in terms of Marx's own theory of exploitation, and actually it is also empirically a wrong statement. Right? Why it is wrong in terms of Marx? Because it doesn't fit the theory of exploitation. Right? If exploitation is unique for a capitalist mode of production, reasonably you can talk only about classes in a capitalist mode of production, where the labor power is free in the dual sense of the term legally free and freed from the means of production, therefore has to sell its labor power, right? If this does not, does not exist, you should not use the term of classes. So this is a contradiction uh, in Marx's own analysis. And of course it is empirically wrong, because that's true there were, were class struggles in history, but was antiquity overthrown by the revolt of slave owners against the slaves? No. It wasn't. As we have learned from Marx, it fell because it was invaded by Germanic tribes. Did in the South uh, slavery end up because the slave revolted against the slave, hold, uh, slave owners? No, because capitalists from the North, right, initiated, right, a war against the South, right? Uh, did the proletariat ever revolt to overthrow the bourgeoisie? Not really. Uh, in countries where we are talking about proletarian revolutions, there were hardly any proletarians. How many proletarians were there in China in 1949? It was a, obviously an overwhelming peasant economy, right? Those were peasant masses who demanded land who carried out the revolution under the leadership of Mao Zedong? Russia not much different in 1917. Uh, so it's simply not true. It's also not true that the classes which were subordinated earlier will become the new dominant classes. I mean, the slaves did not become the landlords, the serfs did not become the grand bourgeoisie, and the proletariat certainly did not become a dominant class in China or in the Soviet Union, right? This is all wrong, right? Uh, uh, but <clears throat> the argument is, uh, uh, you know, still interesting. Then, most importantly, right, the bourgeoisie, he said, is really a new class and probably, arguably, the first real class. The landlords were not a class because they were not constituted in economic terms. They were constituted legally, right? And by customs rather than simply on market exchange and market competition. Um, and he also said, well, this bourgeoisie was an extremely revolutionary force, right? Um, and it actually transformed the whole society. And here I think that is even in the Communist Manifesto, he contradicts himself. He said, well, you know what it did? It transformed occupations which were based on honor before into class positions, right? It converted the position of a doctor or a lawyer or a priest into a kind of class-like position. Though their power traditionally was based on honor. They were honorable positions. Now they become uh, positions for which an income is being paid. All right. And then he writes, and I think it's very important to appreciate that Marx sees that the bourgeoisie did play an extremely important progressive role in history. So it's not only he hates the gods of the bourgeoisie for sure, but he appreciates the contribution of the bourgeoisie for the development of modern society, right? He said the, the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production. Right? In scarce 100 years has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than we have 
all preceding generations together. Well, sounds like somebody who loves capitalism, right? So he, of course he doesn't, because he thinks it will eventually destroy itself. Now the last issue is about how many classes. And well, what follows from the logic of uh, uh, Das Kapital, and uh, I think it is also uh, the uh, uh, point uh, uh, of Marx in the Communist Manifesto, there are two classes. The bourgeoisie and the proletariat, right? Uh, the money bags and the workers. And the workers are exploited by the money bags, and that's the reason for class struggle, and that's what eventually will lead to revolution. But my goodness, where are the middle classes? Um, uh, there were not all that many proletarians in 1867. There was no society except uh, industrialized Soviet Union where the majority of the population was industrial worker, but no ruling class. They were exploited and screwed, don't worry about it. But they were in majority. But it never happened in Western societies. We never reached a point. And then, of course, the industrial working class has been declining. Now, properly speaking, the industrial working class in the United States is probably not more than 15% of the population. So, where is the middle class? So, uh, well, I don't have much time. Let's rush through of this. Uh, well, he said there is, you know, this elemental confrontation between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Well, he does not have the theory of exploitation. He cannot explain it quite well. In, you can do it by now, armed with Das Kapital, right? This is a contradiction because, you know, the proletariat has no choice but sell its labor power and be exploited. And this is, uh, of course, an irreconcilable contradiction. And what about the middle class? Well, Marx said, yeah, well, he, he is, a, of course, even in a political pamphlet, he is a good enough scientist, social scientist, that he will say, no, I, there is no middle class. He knows there is a middle class, that most people do not belong to the bourgeoisie and the proletariat in 1848. And as I said, they never did. But he said, well, but look at it historically. Uh, what we call middle class is disappearing. Look at all those peasants and small artisans and small merchants. They will all disappear. And they will all have to either, very few of them will become big capitalists. And the overwhelming majority of them will become working workers. Well, this is not without insights. Right? For about a hundred years uh, after uh, the... Uh, Communist Manifesto, the trend was going in this direction, right? Self-employment was shrinking, and the wage labor was increasing, right? In big ways, right? Uh, in the mid-19th century, 70 to 90 percent of the population was working in agriculture self and was self-employed in other businesses. Uh, today in the United States, the agricultural population, I don't know exactly, the most current figure is somewhere between 1 to 2 percent, right? Uh, and self-employment has been substantially reduced for a very long time. But things happened what Marx did not foresee, right? And what he did not foresee uh, were, uh, and I probably will leave it here, uh, there are two things what he did not really foresee. Uh, one, that actually this trend turned around. There is no more reduction of self-employment. In fact, there is some increase of self-employment. It varies from countries to countries. In Japan, big way, right? In the United States, some improvement in self-employment. But self-employment is stubbornly resistant, right? You have supermarkets, but you always do have your corner deli shops. And they don't seem to be disappearing, right? I even take my shoes to a shoemaker to fix them, right? Um, so, I, I mean, I do not throw my shoes out. I go to a shoemaker and they fix it for $25 for me. And I don't buy a shoe for 150 bucks, right? Uh, so, I mean, there is mass production has its limits, right? There is a quality production, right, by artisans. And we want that quality production. And the more important argument, 
In fact, you know, Marx conceptualized wage laborers as physical laborers. Physical laborers, as I pointed out, manual laborers, at least in advanced countries, is a minority of the society. In the globe, that's different, right? Because manufacturing and industrial activity was kind of decentralizing the world into the third world. But in the United States and in continental Europe, it's a tiny minority. But there is a big new middle class. And this new middle class are those white collar workers, right? Most of you will become, and what I am, right? I'm, it's not white, white the color. <laughs> right? But this, uh, you know, that means, in my sense, I hardly do any work, right? What kind of value do I create, right? What does it mean? I am exploited? Well, I don't think Rick Levin really exploits me. <laughs> am I an explorer? No, I don't think I exploit you guys. Or do you exploit me because I have to stay up until midnight to grade your assignments? No, it's not really. I actually occasionally have fun reading your assignments, right? So we have a new middle class, right, which simply does not fit the analysis. And where the notion of exploitation loses its insight. Okay, I leave it here. Thank you.